Now 250,000. Now I'm to get 275. Five, I'm to get 275. Three. Now 300,000. Now three and a quarter. 325. Five, I'm to get three and a quarter. I'm to get 325. Now half. Now I'm to get 300,000. And. Hello and good morning from Dallas, Texas at Lincoln Center. And welcome to the Mike McGabble Jones Show. And we are excited. Today is a special, of course, it's a special week. It is Thanksgiving week, and I know a lot of people um, are getting ready to travel across the United States. Um, fuel prices are down a little bit, so it should make it a little bit easier for everybody. Today, we have a super special guest, and it just worked out perfect, uh, the timing did, as we introduce Rick Haas, the, uh, the new president and COO of United Real Estate. And uh, good morning, Rick. And good morning, Mike. Glad to be here. So, um, this, and we talked about this a little earlier, this is, I like this to be more of a conversation mm -hmm. and just kind of let people know who you are, what you're about, what you, what your belief systems are, your history, uh, your history of success, which, mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited about and, um, the direction that we plan on going with our United real estate brands and, uh, the entire model, the, the, the way the market is going today, how the real estate uh, industry is going. And so those are the some of the things that I want to talk about. So you've been in the business now over 30 years. I have. I, I, so many years I've stopped counting. I just round down now instead of rounding up. Well, I, I'm getting kind of afraid. The numbers mm -hmm. are starting to sound like somebody old, and I don't get it. Yeah. Well, I, I can't recognize that person. Yeah, that's not us. So, you know, this is exciting because um, our podcast, we started doing the McGavel Show probably, I don't know, two, three months ago. And, and Zach, good morning to you, by the way. Zach. Gosh, good morning. Sorry, I was looking forward to a conversation among two great men. I was sitting back, I had my coffee. I apologize. That's but good morning. It's Monday, and I'm excited to be here. It is Monday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about your your um, maybe your childhood kind of where, where did you grow up where were you born all that yeah sure I was born and raised in in the Midwest in northern Ohio and and had uh, two great value center centered parents that taught me a lot of good things about that I'd use later back then I didn't know I'd use them but I do now um, I'm uh, I'm actually I think I'm going on my 38th year in the real estate business and and that that comes from starting when I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I started very, very young, and um, been a student of the business as it's evolved. And and uh, I now live in uh, Louisiana. I've spent so l let me give you the quick rundown. I got sure. into real estate when I was 18. I spent about nine years in the real estate business in my hometown in Ohio. I had a great mentor, um, and his name was Jim Maroka. He's still he's still doing business. He's still in Lake County, Ohio, doing great stuff, and. Um, then uh, about about 10 years in, I, I moved to Connecticut where I spent another 10 years with a large real estate brokerage there and got to learn how other parts of the country work from Ohio to Connecticut. Um, short while after that, I ended up back in, um, I ended up back in, in Louisiana or back in Ohio and then down to Louisiana where I've been for 17 years. My, um, my family is still, uh, is, we're, we're in the process of moving, so it's it's a it's a bit of a process. We're going to be here and here and there for a while. Um, I'm live in a town called Mandeville, which is 24 miles across the world's longest bridge, coming out of New Orleans. Um, and um, uh, my my two children, Walker and Caroline, st are, are there. Caroline's in her last year at LSU, and Walker is uh, uh, 25 years old, and the the uh, apple of our eye. So. Well, when you when you mention the longest bridge. Um, that particular bridge, I've actually noted as being the uh, the uh, has the dubious <laughs> distinction of being the largest speeding ticket I ever got mm -hmm. was on uh, that particular bridge. Yeah, well, uh, it's not my largest, but it's my <laughs> most frequent because I was driving it every day for a good while, Mike. Yeah, yeah. And it's got it's got this thing that every three miles is a crossover, yeah. and at fifty percent of those, there's a bridge police yep. waiting to. Catch Mike Jones. <laughs> catch Mike Jones. <laughs> catch him, Rick Hoff. Uh, they, uh, they like to fund their improvements with those tickets. We had gone down to um, Hammond mm -hmm. to have an auction, and it was very successful. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think um, I think it was about a three point eight million dollar auction. And I was just so happy and gleeful and excited. And I was driving a Chrysler three hundred, <laughs> and uh, they should never have rented me a Chrysler no. three hundred. Every time I see a Chrysler three hundred, I say that is a really fast car. But I just remember. 
you know, uh, heading to the airport and uh, all excited about that. And, and I was flying and had the music going. It was just me. Feeling and then good. I, feeling I good. felt feeling good, living good. And I looked up and there was this car and it just kept getting closer and closer. And then it moved over to the left lane. Yeah. And then I just drove up even with him. And it was kind of like a Smokey and the Bandit movie at that point. And then yeah. he just kind of pointed over and I was pretty much toast. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty when you get pulled over and they bother to track you down. You got to remember, you're a captive audience for 24 miles. They can take their time. And they usually do. Yeah. Nice yeah. and safe. So, so yeah. while we're at it, I want to do a shout out to Hal McMillan, uh, a, a guy from, from down in Lake Charles. And, and Hal and I have been friends for years. And, and uh, he came through our uh, America's Auction Academy about 10 or 15 years ago. And his wife did as well, but his birthday was yesterday. So I want to, or, or Saturday, I want to do a shout out to Hal and, uh, and the fact that he helped me with that ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we should talk a whole lot about helping with it's tickets. It's okay. That's it's okay. okay. He didn't do anything wrong. All right, great. Yeah, yeah. He just Happy had a lot birthday. Of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the kids? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you, you've been married? Um, How many years? I've been married 26 years yeah. and um, to Marianne. You know, everybody, I, hopefully the people listening to this podcast will get to meet her soon. Yep. I plan on having her at conference in uh, March mm-hmm. and maybe just before that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah, so he, we're, we're here. I'm, in fact, I, I arrived last, last Monday and I've been looking for houses and we, we, we happen to have a great real estate agent. Yeah, I bet you out. do. Yeah. <laughs> She's doing a great job, and, and I'm trying to get a lay of the land and understand whether the market's going up, the market's going down, which markets I sh- we should buy in. And well, it's an interesting time in Dallas-Fort Worth right now for, uh, for housing. Uh, I think I, I probably bought in the peak. It always seems to happen that mm-hmm. way. I always seem to buy in the peak. Yeah. And always, and an auctioneer should always be planning for the downside. Yeah. You're never ready during no. the downside. No, and you got to buy when you buy, so sure. it's all right. So... Um, you, you ended up in Louisiana. Tell me, uh, tell me about your previous experience as far as um, the company that you were with yeah. and kind of an overview of that. So I'm, I'm coming here from a company that turned 100 years old on my watch uh, last year. And, uh, you know, very, very, it's a rare opportunity to work with a 100-year-old company. And one of the things that we said for the eight years that I was president of that organization, I'll explain a little bit more about it later, As I said, we have to be careful not to be all about legacy and the history of the company. While it's rich and it's valuable and it's impressive, um, and just to get to 100 years is impressive. While it's all of that, my my role in the last eight years was really more about how do I how do I take a company that's 100 years old and make it a company of the next 100 years, not and not the last 100 years. Um, which probably we'll get into in a little bit, but that was one of the m- most interesting things uh, of the conversation I first heard uh, Dan Duffy speak uh, in Miami when I was on stage, he was on stage, uh, and uh, we got to hear each other, and it was just like everything lined up. A couple of disruptors together. A couple of disruptors. <laughs> hey, and there's a, there's a topic for, for a long discussion. Disruption in our business is rampant. I've, in all my time and probably all yours, Mike, you... I've never seen this much disruption in the real estate brokerage yeah. space. Oh, no. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, I got my license in 83. Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine, uh, and I don't know what year you got yours, but. Uh, 78. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's, uh, it was 78 when I went to auction school. So I did the auction thing first, then mm-hmm. got the real estate. Because that's kind of the, that's the way it used to be. Mm-hmm. Not anymore. <laughs> it's the way be. it used to be. And, uh, but it's been incredible, the, the amount of change that we've seen, um, in the last 10 years, in the yeah. last five, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people would even recognize the business. Well, and, and I think, especially especially with um, United um, out there doing what we're doing to change the model, um, I think um, you, you may not recognize it in the next five years. Yeah. It's, uh, so the rate of change has accelerated tremendously. And, and, and I know that um, people say, you know, it's not, this isn't, your, this isn't your grandfather's Oldsmobile kind of thing, but the industry, the rate of change has accelerated, and I think it's putting a tremendous amount of stress both on the brokers who run the organizations that they run, trying to cope with and, uh, all the new competitors, um, but also, um, also, also the agents. You, they have to be extremely well-informed, extremely well-equipped, and uh, that's what I'm, one of the things I'm most excited about delivering. But back to my company for a minute. Um, I, I was president of a company called Ladder and Bloom. We had um, 14, we had 1,045 agents when I started. 
And when I left eight years later and sold the shares of the company back to the, uh, to the principal shareholder, we had tripled in size. We'd gone to 34, about 3,400 change agents. And that, that, uh, that track to triple in that time frame, I don't think has been duplicated anywhere else in the country by a regional company. I know their franchise sales, th that's a whole di different thing. This is just a powerful regional company operating yep. in Louisiana, Mississippi. By the time it was done, we, we had bought the market leading company in Homa, Thibodeau, Cutoff, um, um, Lake Charles, and Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And then of course the big one, we, we moved into Houston with a United Like mm -hmm. model. And uh, I, I, you know, model was changing, and I wanted to go to school and learn how to run run this kind of a model. Um, and I did that by acquiring the company in Houston. It's yeah. a number three market share company in Houston with six and a half million people. That's that's going some. Sure. Um, and uh, and so th we had a mortgage company, a mortgage brokerage operation, a title company, and an insurance company. We did property and casualty and. All of that rolled up to a company called Ladder and Bloom Inc. and I was president of Inc. Yeah, and I was reading your um, your bio and your resume, and it's um, certainly impressive. Thank and you. I think the thing that that I f I find very attractive is the fact that you you had you you know took over a legacy company mm -hmm. because we've been living the legacy of United or United Country, United the, country right. all of it. Um, and I've told people. Um, when I was a young man, when I was a child for that matter, living on a dairy farm about an hour north of here, it was United Farm Agency. Mm. And, I, and I, we, would, we would leave the dairy and go to town like once a week or every two weeks. And I would always pass that United Farm sign. And I always thought for some reason, something always drew me to that sign. And I thought someday I'm gonna do something with that. And didn't make a bit of sense, didn't uh -huh. have a clue what I was thinking, but, but there was something there to it. And, uh, you know the United Country family is is, uh, is a great place to start, especially mm -hmm. if you're if you're in franchise sales and things of that nature. But then, uh, and you and I spoke about this last week, and I was fortunate to be on the front end of starting uh, United Real Estate and being in those meetings, and that com the, the company that you're taking on as the leader um, has nothing but upside. Yeah, nothing but so. upside. I, s I think so. When you perfect the model, so technology is interrupting a great many businesses. <clears throat> For the last eight months, through a company called Envision Advisors that I formed, we, we consulted with organizations that were trying to keep pace with the change, not only in the real estate business, but other businesses as well. Yep. Um, Technology-aided disruptors are, um, are influencing just about every, every aspect of business life today. So, um, so we... W when we get, w when we have, um, you know, one of the one of the key things that drew me to Dan and this company was that it's a, it's a great model and it's a model whose time has come, but it's also built on a proprietary technology platform that is uh, just outstanding. And I, you know, I I talk to a lot of people all over the country. I know the owners of the 72 largest real estate companies personally, and we exchange ideas at at uh, industry meetings. Um, this company, no one I've, I've ever met has assembled um, three things. The business models that we have, the, um, the talent that we have, each in their own specialty. They, you know, and, and, the, and this is to blow smoke, but in, including you, Mike, you have a very unique set of skills and experiences that, um, that you just aren't going to find anywhere else in this country. And then when you get into SCS and the specialized uh, marketing. So f when an agent's got a great opportunity but doesn't um, doesn't really have the expertise or is out of geography or out of expertise in that property type or that class or those complex sales, but they're big sales. Yep. Now we now we can bring that right to an agent to help them win business and do so so professionally that the client feels great about and 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 the agent has a win in their in their career that they would have never had. Sure. So sure. I'm covering a lot of ground, but <laughs> well. Um, there's a, there's a that, lot good here. That's okay. That's okay. Um, when you talk about the, um, of course, I'm interested in everything. I mean, we, we could sit here for, four, you know this, we yeah. could sit here for four hours. You know, I interviewed Burton Gilliam from Blazing Saddles three or four weeks ago. And the funny thing is I had hired him uh, for a promotional uh, thing for the National Auctioneers Association conference and show. In fact, we underwrote it. 
-hmm. And then, uh, and I've known him for a long time, but I, we didn't spend any time together. We came in here and spent an hour together. Then we went to lunch and spent three hours together. <laughs> so it just kind of kept going. Now we're constantly in contact, you nice. know. Yeah. And, and, you know, here's a guy that, you know, he's got a great story. And I, because I was a journalism major in college, I love great stories. But mm -hmm. I love success stories. Mm -hmm. And so when you came on board, I, I uh, of course, I've, I've read your, your bio and stuff. But you have a personal philosophy. And I know, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I'd like for you to tell, because we have a lot of agents. I mean, we, we sent out a notice to all of our United Real Estate offices, but also the five or 10,000 people that are in my group. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we never know who all's on. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. We just don't know. Uh, because Facebook is so big, and, and we do promote it pretty well. And then we've got real PR and, and their people. Tell me what is your, your, your basic foundation and belief system personally for running organization yeah. yeah and maybe and maybe on the personal side as well but the uh, I think the cornerstone of how I lead and, and how I expect operations to, to work is uh, is the the founding or the, uh, is the cornerstone the best best way to say it is the cornerstone principle of my leadership is none of us are as smart as all of us and I, and I know you've probably heard that before, but it's really operationalized in the way I, I work. Um, so many times, and I just told you a great growth story, 1,000 agents to 3,400 agents, and in the course of that, that seven and a half year period of time, we acquired 18 companies. Now, for giving the 24 months at the start where we didn't do, where I was just queuing them up, teeing them up, we, we didn't, where we didn't hire someone, or we didn't acquire a company, that meant an acquisition every four months. And w what that process reinforced for me is that each one of these brokerages and each one of the, p uh, and every bit of the uh, leadership of those companies had something to offer that could be pushed out through the whole organization to make the organization stronger. So it, it's, not just a it's not just an acquisition of P&L strategy, it's an acquisition of talent strategy and ideas. Mm -hmm. And so none of us are as smart as all of us reminds me that um, as a guiding principle, that the, the most knowledge in how to make this a successful company and how to deliver excellence for agents and, and clients isn't in this building. It's out there in, in the real world, the people who are touching the customers and doing it every day. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I put things in place to pull that knowledge back to make sure we have listening opportunities and learning opportunities from the people who are really out there getting it done every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so none of us are as smart as all, all of us um, is, is a cornerstone principle. And I think probably the, the next most important guiding principle, and I, I call them guiding principles because, um, first of all, they are, but the, the idea is that when you're running a large operation, a large organization with a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts, you have to be able to make decisions based on tenets, tenets of, of operating um, or in, in those things are uh, operations, and those things are called guiding principles for me. So the next one I think that is probably the most important next is to build organizational trust. And by that I mean that we don't, we don't engage um, in, in processes whereby we say we're going to do something and then we fail to deliver. You might not always deliver the perfect thing, and that's business. That's what happens. But if you say you're going to do it, the organization can count on it getting done. And so building organizational trust that way. Another, another fundamental of organizational trust building is that you, we have to create an environment for safety and uh, strong communication so that everybody is giving what I call straight talk. Um, it doesn't mean it's perfect, it's not blunt, it's not always accurate, but it's the best of their ability there. Uh, our organization needs to tell it like it is. And um, with that, then you can build on, on expectations and deliver and create uh, a, 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 the right accountability um, and the right reliability, and so the organization grows. And the byproduct of all of those steps is trust. And uh, the, the second, uh, maybe the third thing, is uh, that to build a culture of uh, delivering excellence. Uh, I have a process inside the companies I, I've used for many years called Next User as Customer. 
And what that means is if I have something to deliver to the field, so we have a, let's say we have a broker, a franchise broker out there that we're trying to help grow his company or her company. Whatever I hand off to them has got to be just the utmost quality. Now, they're not the buyer. They're not the seller. Um, they're not the agent, but they are an internal customer. And so next user as customer and, and holding myself accountable for delivering excellence um, is another fundamental or uh, uh, cornerstone of how I do business. Uh, uh, there's, good. there's two more, but I feel like I, I need to stop there. No, I think it's great. Um, I'll ask you a question that is, it's off a little bit, but not really. And you can think about this before you answer it. What, you know, what's the greatest advice that you ever received from someone? Mm. I should have prepared you for that one, but I didn't. Because wow. you've had because you've had mentors too, and I've had mentors. Yeah. I just I just lost mine, my main one about two or three weeks ago, oh, and wow. so and it just made it made everything flow back to remembering specific things that he would say that mm -hmm. made me stop. Well, you know, it's funny we we're talking about guiding principles and where those guiding principles have come from. The three that I just mentioned, they all came from my mentors. Mm -hmm. Each one of them had something to say about. You know, I didn't, I didn't make that up. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't, I didn't, that came from real life experience. Um, uh, be true to your word, uh, build the trust, say, do what you say you're gonna do. Uh, probably the, of the most importance yep. of all that. So how do you see, um, cause I know we, we are in a growth mode. We've mm -hmm. been in a growth mode. Uh, we, we are putting offices in on a regular, regular basis. I, I, can't, I, I don't spend a lot of time tracking every office that opens, but I'm aware. Mm -hmm. I see the emails. Um, what, do you, what, what do you see? And, and, of course, I know you've spent a lot of time. You've been, we've been, uh, I, not necessarily me, but the company and Dan, you guys have been dating. We always say mm -hmm. dating. He's, he he, he said dates. that I, we dated for a year. Y'all yeah. dated for six months. We did. Um, how do you see the growth for United Real Estate? Uh, what's our fast track to growth? I think it's acquiring, it's acquiring the right talent of interested people, interested brokers who understand that this model's time has come. That, um, you know, the, the old, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a good example. Zillow mm -hmm. is a real estate website that has come on, uh, you know, out of, seemingly out of nowhere. Now they've been working at it hard, but they, they're, they're, they've become the dominant website, a dominant website for real estate listings in, in the United States. Well, that, that happened because our, uh, the uh, organized real estate didn't move fast enough to do what consumers wanted. Um, and because they, we didn't move fast enough, it opened up room for a competitor. Now, on the other side of that coin, we are that entity that's refining the business processes, building great careers for agents, helping them find their freedom in their careers, and, and making sure that they do so in a very financially lucrative way. Um, uh, technology is... Technology is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Agents have a lot of choices where they buy their brokerage services, where they where they um, where they um, can grab onto those things that are going to help. But when you can build a, a proprietary platform inside of the company, and they don't have to go searching, and they don't have to go looking, and pay exorbitant fees for it, I think that's just a, an incredible springboard for growth for us. But how we grow is to get the get the message told have our own success stories told widely and attract people who also have the same uh, wor um, work ethic and really are passionate about building their businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, uh, as a broker here in Dallas and I've got multiple people under my license here mm -hmm. in our building. Um, I'm a member of the Metrotex uh, MLS. And, and of course, since Zillow and Trulia and, and you know, a host of other companies have, have tried to come on and control the, the market as far as access from the clients mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, the agents because they, they need that content, you know, they've got to, they have to provide something for people to go to and everybody, mm -hmm. uh, you could, you would know the percentage better than I, what percentage of, of uh, buyers uh, engage online prior to actually speaking to an agent. Well, it depends on who does the survey, but we, you hear everything from 91 to 98%. I, I can't imagine there's many buyers that don't engage in the, 
in the, sometime during their process that don't engage in the um, in the web uh, in their search in their processing of the transaction and even if that um, even if that's not a direct engagement by the consumer it's certainly brought to them by the people who help them uh, online auctions mm -hmm. a good example mm -hmm. you know, it's online sure you know, they don't have to be on site um, when you think about it, if a buyer buyers today spend uh, 20, 24 to 30 months, I think last National Association of Realtors uh, buyer survey said buyers spend 30 months online engaging with multiple websites, 12 to 14, before they buy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, with that in mind, we have to be very careful that we master that that part of our business. If you're if you're not there, if you don't understand conversion and you don't understand how to how to walk someone through to that state of readiness where they buy or sell a property, then you'll be online, but you'll be spending a lot of money doing it. And mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a whole lot of good stuff to come that say show, will will depict very well our ability to deliver great online services, engage with buyers and sellers, and to do so in a cost-effective way that you're not paying exorbitant advertising rates for outside websites. Yeah. Well, you know, when I joined uh, the company, the mothership, uh, the company, you know, our group had just purchased the company, and then we started auction services up in Kansas City, and, you know, quite frankly, we probably couldn't have picked a harder time to, um, to jump in the fray. However, I would argue it was the best of times because mm -hmm. we, we hit the wall, the recession hit, late 07, early 08. Um, I was announced uh, that I joined the company as president of auction services January of 08, or 07, actually 07. And then within, and, and we were growing quickly. And I mean, we, we recruited 55 auctioneers that purchased offices in the first six months. It was the most offices ever sold, I, th I believe, um, by that company. Uh, franchise offices at one time within that period that range of time and so it it and now we have about 250 auctioneers throughout that system well the recession hits mm. everything's tanking you know it's tough I mean it it, it required a couple of things one uh, we had to ramp up um, the the real estate owned stuff and mm -hmm. and things that were in distress uh, this is really where some other platforms like auction.com and some of these other platforms really got their, their heels in and, and were able to, to do that. You know, um, Mark Woodling that works with me as the mm -hmm. vice president of the company, he came from a company called HomeSearch, and uh, HomeSearch was a creation uh, from a, a mortgage company. They, they wanted to control their, their, um, their distressed properties. They wanted, instead of outsourcing it, they decided, we'll just start another company. And mm -hmm. so they started Home Search. And then Home Search was an online auction company where you could buy distressed properties. Well, that was all good and, and fine. Auction.com and Home Search, both in the last two or three years, have changed their name. Now we've got Zome, right. X O M E, which is the uh, former Home Search. And then uh, I believe X10. Uh, or 10x, I'm sorry, 10x is now the name of auction.com. Very strange, kind of. That, that, that talks about, you know, it makes you think. Now, what what was their, th what is their thinking? What Ab about what? name change like that? Yeah, yeah. All right, so here's a, you know, and I don't know their a thinking. And the mortgage company changed their name to Mr. Cooper. Yeah, go figure, right? Oh, I what? know. I, I don't so, know. So, um, there's something that happens in the World Wide Web. Um, if you have a if you have an internet site and you put listing and informa listings and information and auctions online, and you name you name that your name, then well, let me give you an example. If if you wanted to put in a high quality refrigerator freezer in your house, and you sat down at the computer and you said, well, I better I better go check this out, you might come up with a brand. Let's call it Sub Zero, and you would probably go to subzero.com. Um, but what you wouldn't expect to find on subzero.com is you wouldn't expect to find Maytag appliances. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges when, when most real estate operations go out to market with a website is they name it their company. 
and the consumer says, well, if I ever want to see United's listings, or if the, then I go to United. Mm -hmm. But where do I go if I want to see all of them? Because what's not inherent in their understanding of the web is that every site has, it, you know, organized real estate, we have every listing in the, every market we serve. We put the multiple listing out there. It's updated every fi five minutes, right? So we have all the data. But so some of these name changes are designed around creating uh, less proprietary sounding names so that the consumers get that this is, you know, it's generic. We have to tell them what it means. But it's but, different. But it's different, and it represents all the market instead of. And I would suspect that Zome and, and 10X probably got into a situation where they're previous names were well known for having very proprietary information mm -hmm. and by changing they've opened up try they're trying to open up you know the notion of we have things other than just our stuff sure our stuff a absolutely and 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 I, I, I totally believe that yeah totally believe that uh, you know some people in the marketplace uh, overreact to the word auction you know mm -hmm. they, they, they automatically equate auction with distress red flags you know REOs. court court courthouse steps you know the house is burning down that kind of deal uh, and I have spent the better part of 30 years trying to dispel that rumor mm -hmm. and make people understand that it's not always for distress. In fact, probably 80, 90 percent of the properties that go through SCS are not distress sales. Mm -hmm. They are. There's a variety of reasons. Y it could be partnerships uh, that want to dissolve. They, you know, they're just, you know, they've done the, they've done the deal. You know, you, if more you, discreet sales happen at SCS. People who oh, we, have. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A little bit less public way of selling their property. Well, and we do have some people that, that it's, it's funny. Uh, sometimes I have these conversations. They, well, we want to sell the place, but we don't, we don't want any negative press. Mm -hmm. we, we, don't, we really don't want to make a big public deal out of it. I go, well, you know, we have to advertise it. Right. You, you know what I mean? To, you have to market it. <laughs> <laughs> to catch 22. So anyway, we deal with that kind of thing. Um, we, we've probably got about five minutes, so I want to talk about uh, – I want to talk about. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about before I talk oh, about I philanthropy? Think we, we've got. I just. I just want to tell you one thing. Those yep. other two value guiding principles or yes. values that I have, is execute on performance daily. So so often we can get in, into a planning mode and not produce a result today. Yep. And then today turns to tomorrow, and pretty soon we're three months down the road, and we haven't pulled the trigger or executed. So, uh, daily execution against objectives is is something, and then obviously growth. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a model that works best when it's funded by um, a large organization that can continue to invest its, its profits into um, more tools and services for agents and clients. What's uh, Rick Haas's uh, big picture for the next, let's say, let's say three years? What, mm -hmm. How many agents would you like to have on board within the next three years? Um, boy, that's a, that's a tough one because it, 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 you have to, when you answer that question, you have to be careful not to say we're going to we're going to become yeah. a body body count a body shop kind yep. of organization. So I would say that any anywhere from ten to twenty thousand total agents at the end of three years is probably the, and, and it depends it's on how realistic. many is oh yeah it's very realistic. I, when I tell you this model is an idea whose time has come, in the last eight months I've talked to more real estate brokers that have no idea why their margins are slipping, why their profits diminishing why their agents are leaving them. Yep. Um, and, but if we're entering new markets as well, then 10 to 20,000 at the end of three years is... Is, is very manageable. Very manageable. And, and reasonable. And, and it's, boy, we, reasonable. I, it, it's a, actually, it's an expectation for yep. me. So yeah. with, the, with the appetite for what we have that I know that's there, mm -hmm. it's more than reasonable. Good. Okay, well, that makes me happy. Yeah, as a stockholder. As a stockholder. <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about your philanthropic uh, causes. As you know, I, I'm I'm all all over the place when it comes to things like children's causes and and uh, cancer. And I'm you, you. I run the gamut on this, and and mm -hmm. I know you have been very involved with United Way. Yeah. And tell me tell me about your experiences there. Well, um, been on the board for a good while, and and I just finished my year as chairman of the board of United Way, and. Uh, but if, whether it's this is in southeastern Louisiana, southeast Louisiana, New, yeah. uh, New Orleans. Uh, yep, exactly. And um, the uh, the University of New Orleans um, uh, Foundation Board, mm -hmm. uh, Police and Justice Foundation, uh, vice chairman of uh, that organization, on the board of Metropolitan Crime Commission. The the list isn't as important as the concept behind the list. 
Um, I spent a good bit of my time, after a period of time, I spent a good bit of my time uh, giving back to the communities. Now, I, I will tell you that personally, I have a hard time with the notion of giving back. I think giving back in a business is producing and delivering great results for our clients. That's, that's doing what you need to do. But there's this idea that if we build stronger communities in the markets we serve, then it not only helps our agents feel proud of the organization in which the, where they call home, um, but it, it really says to the community that we care more about um, the commissions that we earn. We're not just a transaction-based company. We'll, we'll stay connected to you up until the time you buy or sell a property. And, uh, and then we're done until the next time, 6.2 years or whatever the census says it is now. Later, we'll see you again. We stay involved. We build stronger communities. And one of the things that this organization is really aligned with me on is that very principle. Whether, whether it's the work at all the works that you did. And I saw in line the other day, I saw a check, a $300,000 check that you were, you were making, you were presenting to uh, St. Jude. Mm -hmm. um, that just, it just, the whole story just resonates with how I live. And um, having been the chair of United Way, the, um, I also was the campaign chair two years before that. And when you raise 16 or $17 million every year, and you see what that money does to change the trajectory of people's lives, it's just, you know, I, frankly, I don't know how you can ever not do it. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, the glass yeah. is half full. When you're given to somebody else, it's 100% full. Well, the great thing about philanthropy and giving back and, and making things happen, you know, that used to be on my, that used to be my line on my uh, emails and everything, let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that. I believe that, you know, even the smallest effort can change other people into what their efforts are. And then it just, it seems to steamroll. And, and there, we're only limited by our, ourselves, yeah. what, our, our own personal involvement. And, you know, so when you know, I read, um, you're, and I've worked with the United Way before as well here in Dallas, Fort Worth. But I, uh, I, I love those philosophies and uh, I love to be a part of associations that, that that make a difference. Yeah. And so yeah, I think we're, we're a really good fit. Yeah, we're extremely good fit. That, there's just a lot of good stuff that we can do. Now, I will tell you, I'm still unwinding a lot of the yep. stuff that I'm on, and then there's some national boards. I promise I won't introduce yeah, you yeah, to just, anybody yet. I'm looking at that your your eyes. Uh, <laughs> I'm wondering if you're thinking I'm going to be, uh, you know, no, not yet. I got no, a, I got no, a I lot of work to I do. I want you to build the company. That's right. Let's, That's right. Let's shareholder. Work on the, let's work on the company and then. Uh, you're a shareholder. Yeah, you I want, want me to work. Yeah. 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 So, but the, all things in time. And um, uh, where does that come from? It comes from one of the primary, uh, you know, one of those values I told you I got from my parents. There's an old saying there, but by the grace of God go I. Mm -hmm. So when you're lifting somebody else up, you're really lifting yourself up as well. Yeah. And, um, and then of course that shows up. But you know, we're, if not for the fact that we were bo born fortunate to have the environment and that we had, we'd be, we'd be on the other end of those, those, uh, uh, those funds that get raised and the sure. programs that get created. So I'm, I'm glad to be here for that reason too. Well, we thank you very much for that and look forward to uh, introducing you to the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, community. Yeah. Uh, we're excited to have you here. Thank you. And your family in time. Yes. And uh, so I'm, I'm very happy. And, and we, you know, we're, we're office mates too. So we're just a couple of, uh, couple of offices over. So I'll be seeing you a lot. So uh, folks, on behalf of the Mike McGavel Jones Show here in Dallas at Lincoln Center at the intersection of 635 and the North Dallas Tollway, we gladly welcome and, and excited to have Rick Haas on board as our new COO and president of United Real Estate. And until next time, uh, God bless and we bid you adieu. Thanks. Thanks.